my great pleasure today to introduce Rob Benson, who is the Senior Director of Engineering at Twitter. Uh, and he has had a, a long career, did, actually did not start in computer science, but started elsewhere in, in physics, and uh, had spent a detour through VMware before arriving at Twitter. And uh, he's going to talk to us today about the challenges that they face in building a global scale uh, internet service. So with that, take it away. Cool. Thank you. All right. So as Mark mentioned, I, uh, my name is Rob Benson, and I'm a senior director uh, at Twitter. I actually mainly work or run uh, the large majority of the infrastructure crew at Twitter. Uh, I joined about four years ago uh, actually as an engineer at Twitter, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, as, you as Mark mentioned, I have kind of a circuitous uh, path to Twitter. Uh, it started actually working on uh, quantum dots and superconductivity as, uh, at, at the University of Boulder, uh, Colorado Boulder, excuse me. Um, it's, uh, it's one thing uh, when you're working on really hard problems, but uh, ones that people care about are the most interesting, and this turned out not to be one that people really cared that much about. Um, so uh, it was also one where it took uh, days, if not weeks, to grow my samples, and then I would write code much faster and actually do my experiments in the midnight hours and then go writing uh, during the day. So I found that I kind of needed a, a, a bigger velocity. So I actually moved over and worked at Sun and actually at VMware both, working on operating systems and, and the virtual machine monitor. So this is kind of where I got bit by the bug of systems, developing, um, uh, developing hardcore systems. So basically thinking about having never taken a huge number of computer science classes, it was incredibly interesting to me to try and figure out how the CPUs actually worked. Um, and it became so interesting to me that I decided I wanted to try and write them in software. And so when I went to uh, VMware, I actually worked with the crew that spent uh, years and years building the binary translator for x86 and then eventually moving over and doing hardware virtualization. So for a non-computer science person, it was an incredible experience and a great education. But again, at VMware, I found that I was talking to a larger group of people that I cared about, that cared about what I was doing, but my mom had no idea what a virtual machine was, nor would she ever care. Uh, nor would the world. Uh, I may have miscalculated that one. It turned out the world actually did care about virtualization, but it wasn't one where they cared about the software I was working on. So I moved over to Twitter about four years ago, and like I said, I actually worked as an infrastructure person in the first uh, 60 uh, engineers at the company. And it, it became a very fulfilling experience for a couple of reasons. One was I was working on a really complex, hard systems problem, although from the exterior, it's a very simple product. So it was very compelling from that comp that perspective. It was also globally used, but not global scale yet. So it was crashing all the time, which I'll talk about. But this was one my mom understood. This, I finally got to a place where I could work on a really hard systems problem. I can actually articulate the value um, to the rest of the world. So kind of why am I here? Uh, I came up to Seattle about a year ago, and I started meeting a number of the professors, uh, Mark, Luis, uh, Dan and a couple of others, and started to realize that the University of Washington, as the rest of the world had already realized, was a fantastic computer science school. And it was one there was a lot of interesting uh, systems stuff going on, as well as programming languages stuff. And uh, I really wanted to come back um, and start working on building a community as an engineering leader in Seattle. So Jeff, who's over here on the left, and I actually became, uh, kind of pitched the executive team that we wanted to start an office here, and so we did that about a year ago. Um, and now we have actually a permanent office and, and uh, about, I think, 40 engineers and 19 teams or so. So it's one where I really wanted to come back, give a talk about the infrastructure that we're doing, um, not only because we're do I kind of want more collaborative research with the University of Washington, get more ideas from you, as you'll see, as well as some of you will go on and want to find a career in the, in the industry, and we'd love to hire you. So uh, kind of getting to the actual meat of the talk, uh, the Twitter infrastructure story. So kind of going to the title, I'm gonna go in chronological order where we start with the past. So when I started, it turned out that I started a week before the World Cup started, uh, which was very fortuitous for me because it was a point at which the system totally exploded. Um, it was one where uh, the entire world cared about a single event and there were time boundaries to those events and there were very clear spikes to those events. So when the game was going on, here's the traffic, you'll see that there were very large spikes whenever, whenever there was a goal. Whenever there was a goal, there was those 
ridiculous horns. And whenever that happened, it meant the system was going to go down, at which point then I would start not sleeping for hours or days. So it was one where the first three or four months of, of my life at Twitter were incredibly interesting. I got to know the system inside and out because I was basically up all night trying to keep it up. Everybody knows the fail well. This was a, the infrastructure story for Twitter for a very long time. And there was a number of reasons for that, which we'll get to in a minute. But kind of looking at this classic graph of uptime, where the, the y-axis is kind of the percentage of time or, uh, that we successfully served a request, whether it be an API or a web request. You'll notice that when I started, we're at the very uh, minimum of the line. Uh, we're around the World Cup. Before that, we'd actually survived on our architecture, which was a, uh, a monolithic Ruby architecture. And then when we got to the World Cup, we realized that didn't work. And then from there on is when we kind of really started investing in infrastructure and trying to figure out how to build a global scale system. So there's a couple reasons why our uptime was really bad. Um, I mentioned here that there was basically any mistake that was made as we were going through and trying to fix the problems that we found, whether they be uh, memcache issues, whether they be uh, too much load on the DBs because we're doing things multiple times, whatever it was, we would start to try and ship code over and over and over again to the site. Uh, Twitter, like a lot of the web companies, ship multiple times a day, if not tens to hundreds times a day, depending upon the system. And Anytime we did that, we were always deploying, in this case, tens of times a day to the same piece of code that was running on every one of our systems. As that happened, anytime we made a mistake, we dropped the system on the floor. And it was really hard to actually isolate failures. The other ones were our back end was not super reliable. And by back end, I mean here, very simply, MySQL and memcache. So one of my first jobs was to work on the memcache internals. Uh, my uh, second or third week, I think, at Twitter, I took the system down for uh, eight hours um, to zero. So, uh, and basically I did that, if you can come ask me the details later, but it was one where I made a very simple change uh, in the application and Memcache couldn't actually deal with that change because it had a slab allocator. Uh, and once I did uh, allocate all of its memory into its specific buckets, it actually couldn't uh, rebalance, and I actually changed the way that the, the size of the objects, at which point then it actually couldn't store anything in cache, which totally dosed our, our, our MySQL backend. So that's the story. So there was, it was not, it, there was no clear way of understanding how these things were related. There were other problems when we were actually, in, we weren't in our own data center, so we had network constraints that we actually couldn't get around. So we had to figure out, either through compression or other things, how we could actually squeeze through the tiny pipes that we didn't own, nor had any idea of how big they were. At one point, they wouldn't even tell us what, what the topology was. And then the other one that really got to me, actually, was when I was at Sun, I was a fanboy of, I'd worked on a little bit of Solaris, done a lot of performance work. I was a huge fanboy of Dtrace, a lot of the Solaris 10 stuff. When I got to VMware, I actually created a very similar system for virtualization with code smashing and such, and it was really fun. When I got to Twitter, I realized, and I've, I've pulled a number of my friends who've kind of distributed to the social media companies, that is true across all of them, is that they, they don't uh, prioritize building the systems by which they can watch production in a way that they can do meaningful debugging. So it's not one where you like, classically can get on a system and start profiling and do full stack profiles and that kind of stuff. That's just not something that's done very commonly. And it's not something except for a Google um, that I've ever seen in the wild. So when I got to Twitter and I was trying to figure out how to fix some of these issues, it became very obvious that I had absolutely no data by which to figure out what was going on. So this is the actual architecture, hand wavy, hand wavy, hand wavy, that we were basically with. The only part that I missed was the memcache box, which is big. Um, but basically, the, the, mean, the point of this slide is that all of our code was basically in the same repository, and it was deployed as a single artifact, which was really not great. It was really a problem for us. So, but at the same time, as you'll see as I go through the talk, there are some pros to being in a monolith. When, you're, uh, when you actually create a system from the ground up, it's actually super easy to develop. You have everything in front of you. You deploy everything at once, super easy. And testing it is a cinch, right? You bring it up. You mock out the back ends, and you can kind of play with stuff. As your system grows, though, it gets obviously a lot more complex. Deployment of this stuff, as I mentioned, is easy. You have one copy of it. You basically splat it out to every single system in your, or server in your data center, or colo, as it, the case may be. And at that point, you can actually have a service up and running. Uh, capacity planning is relatively simple. If you have multiple API endpoints, you take your noisiest one, you look at the peak, and you capacity plan to that. It's not. Uh, it, it makes it a little bit easier. You don't have to worry about lots of little things in the data center. Um, 
obviously the cons of going in this approach is that in our monolith, we were actually on a Ruby runtime, which was my second job, was to try and figure out how to get as much out of that old runtime as possible. It's in, it was interpreted, it was compiled, so Ruby was down to in, be, being interpreted on the bytecode level. Um, it was, there was absolutely no concurrency, there was no threading. Uh, because we were in a single code base and there were no hard guidelines on what abstractions or APIs there were within the actual code base, things started to leak, at which point then it was really, really difficult to figure out, especially using the metamagic of Rails, where any piece of code would actually go next. There was no simple linearity between actually what was gonna, where the request would come and then how you would trace it through the system. And then, as I mentioned with the uptime stuff, it became very, very difficult to run it in production as the thing scaled. So the solution for us, which is obvious and one that many people have gone to, is to basically destroy it uh, and to break it up into multiple pieces. So classically service-oriented architecture. We wanted to get to a place where we had lots of little pieces running in the data center instead of, as opposed to one. And the reason that we wanted to, the, some of the goals for that project were, we wanted to basically improve the performance drastically because we were as, I don't know actually how, much, how far we've published, uh, publicized this, but the whale would actually happen when we went over five seconds. So for any internet company, that's relatively embarrassing. Uh, if you can't respond to a certain portion of your request within five seconds. Over time it got better, but it was one we still were having a real problem dealing with based on the architecture. So that was one of the goals. The other one was reliability, isolation of failure. Obviously you have little pieces, some of them fail. If it's a code change to a very simple, or excuse me, to a very low traffic API endpoint, you don't want that bug to actually kill the rest of your service. So it, it basically made it such that we could uh, work on the reliability. Um, the other big one is the separation of responsibilities and concerns. So basically each team could actually take a uh, part of the architecture and actually go off and figure out the business logic for it, understand the deploy cadency, uh, cadence, uh, de development in whatever way they wanted with a couple caveats, and basically be the master of their own domain and their own deployment, which really enabled them to go much faster, which is the final one, which is developer productivity. When we were all, as we started to grow as a community of developers past I don't know, like 60, 80, it started to become where that one code base was impossible to work in. You had no idea what was going on next to you, to the side of you. You couldn't do enough code reviews to keep kind of abreast of what was going on. Especially as the abstraction started to leak, you couldn't even trust that you were reviewing your files and somebody else wasn't, trust, wasn't touching them. So it was one where you can obviously you get blamed, but it wasn't one where you deployed, you could actually track through and say, okay, this is logically gonna work or this logically isn't. So the SOA was gonna get us a lot of these things. So kind of coming to the present, what do we look like right now? So right now, we process about 500 million tweets a day. We have about 230 million active users. 75% of our active users are actually on mobile, which means they hit our API as opposed to coming in and, and rendering web pages, which I think is one of the most for any of the, the social media companies. It's obviously because, well, maybe not obviously, but it's one of the major reasons is because of our 140 character limit. It's where we started. It's where a lot of people have been using us for a very long time. It's also one of the reasons why we've seen a pretty good penetration in the international community where there's low or high end phones. And then 77%, as I mentioned, of, this, of the accounts are actually outside the United States. So this is, again, a very simplified view, but the core and the heart of Twitter at this point. Uh, you'll notice that some of the code names have leaked out. It should be no surprise to anyone that we name all of our, most of our services, 99.9% .9 of them, after birds. So uh, the back end, you'll see there's T-Bird and Flock. These are uh, basically uh, our tweet store, our social graph. We use Memcache still, uh, although far less um, severely as we did before. Redis, uh, which is a really nice backend, and we don't use it in clustered mode, but we use it as a single node because you can actually uh, do uh, data st structure specific type act, uh, actions server side as opposed to pulling all the data across. A good example we use this primarily for timelines, which is the time ordered tweets. If you look at Twitter, it's usually a reverse chronological order of the tweets. We use Redis basically to be able to slice that stuff server side so we don't have to pull all that data over the network. Um, but the big piece here you'll notice is within the logic and the presentation that we've broken that up into a number of core pieces where you kind of can see that in the logic side we've divided it upon core noun 
uh, of Twitter. So there's tweets, there's users, there's timelines, there's a social graph, there's DMs. And we basically put teams around each one of these and basically ask them to rip all of the logic out of the monorail, put it into a JVM-based service, and basically stand it up without any bugs and without any reliability issues. Uh, it's worked relatively well. It's actually worked super well. It's just taken a long time, which I'll get into in a second. Um, the other thing that I'd like to note on this, this slide is actually that in the presentation layer, you'll notice the monorail is still there. Um, these smashing of the monoliths t tend to take forever or they never actually end because you don't see any value in pulling out some of the logic that still exists there because it's for things in the system that never get hit or very rarely and it doesn't really actually matter if you pull those things out. But you also notice two other things. One is that there's an API bucket and a web bucket. And one of the things at the end of the talk I'll talk a little bit about is one of the things that we've struggled with from a SOA perspective is how SOA do you go, right? Like if, if you're building your system, when you first start your development, you kind of want it in one place. You want to do kind of what we did in the very beginning. The other spectrum is basically a service per user, or excuse me, per developer. Or basically every developer has total freedom with whatever they want to do. That's obviously not scalable, although I'll argue that in the service-oriented architecture, that is actually a valid uh, place because you actually are thinking about integration testing end-to-end, -end, and you'd like to be able to kind of think about a whole system and have a person stand up, Twitter in a box, if you will, something we're not doing well right now. But anyway, these two API and web boxes, you'll notice, are actually something where we're ki currently kind of going through the next monorail or monolithic code base. Okay, what should we spit out? What should we not? How should we theme it? And that kind of stuff. So th I think this is an architectural theme that we're going to go through for the rest of our lives, which is basically figuring out which service should do what kind of Unix style. I'm going to run through really quickly a couple things um, that the tools that we used or the things that we created to basically enable ourselves to do the the smashing of the monorail in a way that was going to allow us to be super successful going forward without diving into yet another bucket of chaos. Um, the first was uh, the, we basically, I'm, well, a group of us, uh, but I took the arrows for it, uh, decided that what the runtime we were gonna go for wasn't, we weren't gonna go to native. Uh, that wasn't a huge option at that point. We were gonna go to another managed runtime, so we were gonna go to the JVM. Um, the JVM has, I worked with a lot of those guys, actually at VMware, a lot of the VMM guys were actually ex-Sun JIT guys. Um, but the, the JVM has a, a number of really nice properties. One is it's just a world-class compiler, world-class JIT. It's been around for a long time. There's no bugs. So it's not something where I had to pour a huge amount of energy into that side of it, which I had to pour, I had to pour a huge amount of energy into the Rails one, and I couldn't squeeze that much out of. The other one is that it's a managed memory environment. This comes as a plus from the development standpoint, a negative from the runtime perspective. Uh, garbage collection is not something that's easy uh, Easy is the wrong word. It's not predictable, which is a huge problem for us, and it's one that I'll, I may talk about later. The other one that's really big for us is actually it has the ability to run multiple languages. One can ask how well, but it can run them. So we basically had two communities uh, of JVM developers at uh, Twitter very early on, one for on the Java side, the other one on the Scala side. There was a bit of a religious debate as to which language we should go to. So at the end, it, from my perspective as an infrastructure guy, sorry, uh, it was I didn't really care. All I cared is they got to the JVM and we moved forward. So those the JVM became a huge part of our success because it was a runtime that had um, it, obviously concurrency was part of its model, part of its beginning, and it was one where we could easily if one thread was blocked because something downstream was actually uh, going slow, any of the other requests would rat around it. You know the other threads would actually do work, which was not the case with the with the Ruby runtime. The other major piece that was actually something that we invested significantly in was a project called Finagle. Finagle was, uh, is uh, a standard part of our stack now, but it was basically people stepped back and were thinking about, okay, we're gonna build these network services. And we started to see people go off and they were really caring about every single piece of the infrastructure. And these were people who were product engineers who were supposed to be thinking about 
machine learning or some sort of data algorithms or some other stuff or rendering the web or whatever it was. But they were really trying to figure out retry policies, back off, uh, connection handling, all sorts of different things that we really didn't want them to do. And if you have a, a very large distributed system where everybody's doing it in a different way, you get some really crazy failures. Um, so what we decided is that we wanted to have an opinion and I think for larger engineering organizations, this tends to be hard, but it was one we lucked into on this side, where we invested on basically trying to build an abstraction for the developers so that the product engineers could kind of abstract away a lot of the details when it came to talk, building network services. So in this case, as I mentioned, the Finagle library abstracts away the common challenges of network programming. It became the substrate for our network services. It's something that took us about six months to a year to build. It was actually first deployed in our uh, front-end HTTP proxy, which we built uh, in software as opposed to hardware. So we have far much control of our routing. So it had a, we kind of went after the hardest thing first, one with the most constraints, especially performance. But it was one that actually worked. So to give you some idea, although I'm not going to dive into the details, um, what, from the abstraction perspective is that the library basically allows the developer to build a service or to build a client to talk to a service. They use the exact same library. And in this case, you, as you build your library, and again, I won't go through the syntax, but the highlights here are basically you can build a server with a very simple call and that you can actually name it. You can actually hook up a stats receiver so that every single one of these is the same when it comes to our observability system. So when you're looking at any single process that's running a finagle process, you'll actually see the exact same stats for GC, the exact same stats for the transactions. So there's a lot of conformity so that the operations folks can actually deal with these systems in a uniform way. The other thing too is that we abstracted away uh, the, the, the protocol handling. Uh, which I'll get to in a second, the, the timeouts and those kinds of things. On the opposite side, with the cluster, on the client side, if you actually have a client and you want to talk to uh, a, a service below or uh, down this, the pipe, you actually will call out cluster here, timeline service cluster is actually an example. But one can imagine that this is an abstraction uh, first to a flat file, which basically goes off and gets the servers and the ports. But it also allows us to very seamlessly move to a dynamic naming system where we can actually have things moving around the data center, which will become very uh, key later. Here, this is only some of the things, but I just threw them in for fun, which is the number of hosts that it connects to, the idle time for those connections, how many retries, and how, how fast it times out. But these are the kinds of things where a person can, a, a developer can either cargo cult them or whatever uh, and actually set them uh, per their service, but it wasn't one where they actually had to go figure out the logic. The work we're doing now actually in this space is actually to remove a lot of these configurations and make it something where it's far more dynamic and something where the developer doesn't have to worry about timeouts, doesn't have to worry about a lot of things except for naming, routing, and a couple of other things. So just to list the stuff out, Finagle, as we built it, dealt with a consolidated logic for the connection management, the protocol codex, Transient error handling, which happens a lot in large data centers, will, uh, hardware will just go away for whatever reason. Actually, garbage collection is a huge reason for this. If you have a process that goes just kind of dark, it's usually actually just GCing. Uh, and so you want to try and figure out how to deal with that as quickly as possible, let it go away, uh, route traffic away from it, and then route it back, because it usually doesn't take very long. Um, one that I think is really cool and kind of highlights the fact that this was truly a success when it came to consolidation is that we basically went off, it was actually one of my Hack Week projects, um, but somebody else built it, uh, was um, trying to figure out how we could build something like Dapper, which is a Google system, to do RPC tracing. Because once you get to an SOA model where you don't have everything in one process, it's really hard to figure out the vertical slice of any request. And uh, having just lived through, after that, I think about a year of pain of trying to figure out where the latency was in our system, I did not want to go to a place where we were going to have a harder time trying to figure out where the latency were, uh, was in any request. So I wanted to try and figure out how we could do the tracing. Turns out we built it as a, the server side, uh, which you can ask me later about. But the interesting part, I think, is that on the, on the service side, the, the network service side, it is incredibly easy for us to inject this into the Finagle client without actually anybody ever knowing. So it became very easy for us with the name of the service and a couple other things to drop timings for the transaction envelope with any of these services and then tie them together in the aggregate and then actually be able to answer the question of statistically, what are, the biggest, what are the largest number of requests we get? 
per API endpoint. Okay, what is our 50th and what is our 99th? Looking at kind of looking at the different traces, and then as I'll show you in a minute, you can actually look at this through a UI. The other one is service discovery, which is kind of the topic that I mentioned before, where um, if you are a client and you're reaching out to try and figure out how to resolve the names for your downstream dependencies, um, it's one where we can actually use a flat file behind the scenes or we can actually use a very complex system. So that was, again, a super key advantage that we had. So the infrastructure could move much faster than the services above us as long as we were uh, backward compatible in the way we were working with them. And then finally, very simply, we exposed the same metrics for every single one of these. So now that we have hundreds to thousands of these services or clusters of these services in our, in our data center, it became one where everyone kind of looks the same, especially from the core health and, and uh, metrics that we exposed. So very simply, just to show the example here of the, of the codex, is that without any changes to the actual library and only specifying uh, a different string within the codex of the clients and in the codex of the servers as to what they wanted to speak. We basically have the HTTP proxy with Finagle speaking HTTP with Timeline API service. The Timeline API service speaks Thrift to the Timeline service, which does the business logic. And then the Timeline cache, again, that talks to it with, uh, with Thrift. And at that point, that's basically our sharding layer across Redis using the same Finagle uh, library, but a Redis codec that we built. Um, it basically speaks to a lot of the Redis backends. So it was a really nice win from our perspective that somebody could, uh, we had multiple teams building, uh, actually the cache team build the Redis and the, mem the memcache codecs and actually just slipped it in, into the Finagle library and then everybody gets them for free. So it was a really nice, simple way of abstracting away the people from the, the core problems of the infrastructure. As I mentioned, maybe a little bit too long-winded on the distributed tracing part, this is kind of the end result of uh, of our system that we call Zipkin, which we actually open sourced. Um, and it's one where you can see, obviously, that this is an older trace where there is a metric ton of memcache. But you can start to see that the envelope of the entire request is on the top. And then as you see the waterfall graph of where time was being spent. This has been super valuable in a couple of cases where we started to see very weird blips on some of the majority of our endpoints. So the SOA approach is obviously super valuable, but there's obviously some trade-offs. One is the deployment of Twitter is far more complex than it was before. Um, if you wanted to spin it up in a data center, now you have thousands of little things as opposed to one big thing. Inter integration testing becomes incredibly hard. If not, it's not impossible, but it's one we haven't solved well yet. Uh, it's one where you have to have a great deal of organizational and en engineering uh, investment in some of uh, packaging, um, understanding what services are using what version of their package at any time. A lot of that stuff in the very beginning of our, of our, uh, our journey on the SOA bandwagon was uh, kind of every team did whatever they wanted and it became harder and harder for us to do this. This is actually something we're tackling right now to great success, but routing becomes a problem. Uh, the other one is there's uh, diverse utilization of each of those services, depending upon if they're hot or not. It also could be that the way that they're tuned is they use a lot of CPU and very little memory. So what we found with the monolith is that we usually had the same characteristics because of just the law of averages across all the front ends. They would all handle roughly the equal distribution of our API endpoints. And you would start to see that the, it would be relatively easy to figure out how to, like I said, capacity plan them and figure out the utilization. As you break the things out, they have far, far different uh, utilization, which means you're leaving a lot of dollars because there's a lot of slack on the machines, especially now that the machines are so much larger. The other thing is that multi-DC failover is, is more difficult. As you start to break it up, you can fail over at multiple places within your stack, and it becomes harder to figure out where to do it and when. Um, it's a good problem to have, but it's one that you, it, you have to approach it in a different way, and it's one that we have, but uh, it took us a little while. And the last one, which is kind of interesting, is when you have everything within a single process, a request basically lives and dies within one process, synchronization and consistency become relatively easy things to deal with, um, especially if you have no concurrency. Um, but once you actually move to the SOA model, you want to have global state or you want to have some uh, global source of truth, let's say, for where a service is. You have to start to rely on external systems that actually can give you that consistency. Zookeeper is a good example. It's one of the ones we were using. So as we entered into this brave new SOA world, we started also kind of peeling back and starting to think about what is, 
Now we kind of know how we want to develop systems. We stumbled into that. We built half of it. Um, now we wanted to think about, okay, let's deploy these things. Okay, now we're kind of, we need to figure out the, the brave new world of how a data center looks with this new model as opposed to our old. The standard picture of data center with a lot of computers. Um, a lot of challenges when you actually had the standard model of having one process on one computer and they're dedicated and it's pinned. So that's, uh, in the old world where we had a monolith, it wasn't something that really kept us up at night. We just deployed a lot of servers. Uh, they usually, like I said, the load would kill us, but at the same time, it wasn't a huge complexity. In the SOA world, you started to see that there were smaller clusters that didn't have as much breathing room. We could have given them more capacity, but we started to notice that one of the things that happened is that one of these servers would go down, whether it be the process or the hardware, and then the entire service would go down. And it would only be a portion of the service, remember the isolation, but it would be one where if it was critical enough, it would cause us pain. The other thing with the way, like I mentioned before, when it came to the efficiency is that as you look at the axes of the resources within any one of the, the processes that are running, you're only utilizing here in red of the entire capacity of the box, which is the gray or the lighter gray portions, only certain proportions of those, where on our, on our servers we use very little of the disk because we're uh, actually logging to, through Scribe. And the third thing that with, with kind of the, the data center that we arrived to with the SOA world is um, as you're deploying and thinking of working on some of these services or you're creating your new ones, you would basically have to wait for hardware for a long, or like a while, right? Like weeks, days, whatever it was. Uh, you'd have to sit there and as a developer, compiles are long enough, right? It, it breaks our flow. Now we have to wait for hardware, it's gonna kill us, right? So it it's just became obvious that we needed to try and figure out how to solve all these problems in a different way. In the end, static partitioning is harmful. So basically, anytime you dedicate a single process to a specific hardware piece of hardware, you're kind of in a really bad state. Unsurprisingly, from where I came from, the first thing I thought of was, why don't we build a cloud? Um, so it was one where uh, I had some very specific opinions about how cloud should be run after having built uh, the core of one of the biggest uh, providers. But what, I decided, what we decided actually was that we were gonna go in a little different model than the one that I had worked on in the past, specifically because I didn't think that was a good fit, which I'll talk about later. But what we started investing in was two open source projects. One of them actually just was open source, so it's in the incubator, but Mesos was actually an Apache project before it actually came to Twitter. It was actually built by a guy who was uh, an undergraduate here. His name is Ben Hinman. He eventually went to the University of California, Berkeley, and started this project there. And these two projects you can kind of think of as uh, the operating system for the data center. I'll get on into a more detail of what I mean there. Here's just a rough schematic, and again, these are hand wavy because of time. But you can think of Mesos as the kernel of the data center where basically it sees, uh, it's got a master-slave architecture, and it sees that there's a huge number of resources that can be used by uh, processes out in the world. And so what it, do, what it does is it actually coordinates with what we call frameworks or schedulers, and Aurora is an example of one of those, which abstracts away from the developers the idea of physical systems. So in this system, the Mesos Aurora world, what happens is the slaves actually publish the resources that are available to the cluster, to the schedulers, to the frameworks, and the frameworks take advantage of those offers. So an example of an offer is, hey, I'm a machine that has four gigs of memory, well, actually not four gigs, 64 gigs of memory, uh, 16 cores. Anyone who wants to actually take them can take them. Um, and so the Aurora is where we've invested kind of in our user land scheduler, if you want to take my OS analogy way out there. Kind of in the way, and Mesos is architected in a way that you can actually have multiple frameworks running on the same kernel. I kind of think about this in the same way that if you look at the internals of the Solaris scheduler, you'll see like a real-time scheduler, you'll see a, a fair scheduler, you'll see a couple of others. And so you start to be able to run multiple things in different ways or schedule them in different ways on the resources. It just so happens that this is done at a data center, data center scale. So Mesos was our solution to basically dealing with a static partitioning problem and basically making all of the resources that we're offering and actually were accepted by the jobs running were dynamic and we can move things around and we could make sure that that was not a problem for us anymore.
as I mentioned, and I love this picture, more of a troll, uh, because Ben actually did a Wired article recently um, for the Mesos, um, for the Mesos infrastructure. You guys should definitely have him back. He gives like a hell of a design talk. Uh, he thought about this system for a really long time. He actually also interned at uh, Google and had thought about these problems kind of in multiple different uh, ways. And eventually it settled on this one. And I think it's much different than what the, the Google guys published with the Omega stuff. It's very different than the classical cluster management software that you see. All of it's open source, so you can go look at it, but it's been a key part of their success. Some of the features that we have in there, as I mentioned before, is the master-slave architecture. Um, we have a number, obviously, large number N of the slaves, and then you have the masters that can do failover. And within the masters, they do leader election, they keep state, therefore you never actually would lose anything if you lost the master, it falls over. We actually turn out to, f to do failure, master failover, I think, relatively frequently. I think it's on the order of weeks now, if not days. Um, as I mentioned, the way that this, the architecture worked uh, is basically offering these fine-grained, and when I say fine-grained, I mean not just systems, but actually the resources in the system up to these frameworks for developers to claim. And I, again, I mentioned the fault tolerance where any single p part of uh, Mesos code, whether it be on the slave or whether it be in the masters, it can fail and it can restart, it can recoup its state uh, because it's all local and then actually run uh, without actually bouncing as of recently any of the jobs that are running on that specific slave or in the cluster itself. So it's a huge, huge part of our success when it comes to how we think about dealing with lots of little things running in our data center that basically make up the core of Twitter. Aurora being the scheduler is uh, a couple, it, it's really nice for a couple different reasons. There's a single deployment strategy. We have a DSL uh, that's far more simple than some of the folks that have built these things in the past by which a developer can come and say, I have a job, here's the pack package I wanna run and here's the resources that it's gonna need and then I have 20 shards and I need you to put 20 copies in the data center. And at that point, you deploy them. And it's part of the system itself which is super important because as you start to see hardware fail or processes fail, you'll actually start to see the services restart within under a second. So what we've seen actually in the data center now is that when racks go out, because the top of, top of rack switch bounces or just totally goes dead, you'll start to see those services actually be rescheduled on other parts of our cluster within seconds. And because of the way we do service discovery, traffic's routed to them. So it's something that would have killed us in the past and now is not even a blip on our radar. The other thing that's really good for Aurora, and we'll get to this as to the next steps later, is that uh, it's, as it currently stands, well, maybe six months ago, it was a relatively um, first, it was the first version of our scheduler, which would basically try and figure out how to give, um, give a lot of uh, space for each one of the processes. But we started to do co-location, which is basically to say that if a box only is half reserved, why can't we use the other half? Why don't we actually schedule something that fits into that slot and then we actually get higher utilization. We can start to use those resources for things that we couldn't use them before. And I'll get to that in a, in a little bit. So one small tangent, because uh, someone asked me when I actually showed them these slides, is uh, to virtualize or not to virtualize. Um, I think virtualization is a fantastic technology. I loved working on it, super geeky. But, uh, and it's a great solution for a lot of problems. One of the reasons that I went to Twitter was because I owned the entire stack from the top to the bottom. Nobody else could uh, actually, it, no one would mandate that I buy any of the software, which it turns out I haven't. Most all of the infrastructure stuff that we work on is either open source or stuff that we've grown internally, and a lot of that stuff we actually open sourced as well. Um, and so when you have that, one has to contemplate how many layers of software do I need? So I don't necessarily wanna have a huge number of operating systems running on my box. It adds complexity, having worked on this stuff, a lot of complexity. Uh, the performance actually isn't as much of a concern anymore because hardware virtualization is really good. The chip vendors took 15 years, but eventually they got there. And now they're actually doing a really good job. So, but it was one from my perspective which had more to do with how can I make what is a very complex distributed system not any more complex than it has to be to actually get the job done. And virtualization was adding complexity where I didn't think it was valuable. So our cloud at this state has thousands of servers. Second. Uh, do, do you think what will be true? That you want more virtualization. Um, 
I don't, well, it depends on what kind of virtualization. Um, I don't think I, well. A lot more complicated over time, and the kinds of services you offer get more complicated. And if you don't have virtualization, you'll be doing some of the things you said you don't want to do, like statically allocating machines. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the reason, if we get there, I failed. Because if we're not building the infrastructure that allows the people to build the systems in a way that we don't get stuck in those situations, then. Uh, I think we've, as, a, as the infrastructure group, actually not done the job that we need to do. We need to not, like, I've seen this happen in the past, especially when people buy software, is they basically get stuck in a situation they can't make modifications of it to figure out how to put it in a world. So they, very classically, early on in VMware's days, we found a lot of Japanese companies had print servers they could never use again because modern software couldn't actually boot the OS. So we, being a young company, created a, slowed down a couple of instructions, got them out of a race condition, and then all of a sudden they had print servers again in VMs. But it was one where they were working around a problem. And I guess what I'm saying is I feel, and I'm, I could be wrong, there's definitely a chance I could be wrong, but I feel like if we engineer the problems correctly, we can actually solve the problems at, at their core as opposed to wrapping them up into a box and then putting them on the side. Um, one thing that's, yeah, I think that's true. The only other thing that I've thought of in the past is virtualization gives you some really nice features. One is you have the idea of being able to checkpoint processes and move them around. So you don't have to worry about boot time, which we don't because a lot of our stuff is stateless. But you also have some stateful things that would be really nice. Um, but we've architected it as such that we've pushed those down in the stack as far as possible and are dealing with them in a, a little different way. But there is a chance. But I, and it's also, there's multiple different types of virtualization. You can imagine virtualization that doesn't actually, isn't full encapsulation, and it virtualizes resources in a different way, and that you use them, but you don't actually have to go with a whole different, like, uh, ring one or ring zero or, or any of that kind of stuff. So. so our cloud right now has thousands of servers in multiple data centers, runs hundreds of services in each of them, and many of those services are very critical to Twitter. One of the early adopters of the cloud actually was Revenue, um, which was obviously very critical. Uh, and now most of our core services that you, I showed you in the previous slide when it came to our core nouns are actually running in there as well. So this is the kind of stuff where you wake up in the middle of the night if anything goes wrong, um, because it's running now uh, a public company. <laughs> Um, so our cloud is a win uh, for a couple of different reasons that I alluded to before. Basically, we've seen a huge utilization increase within our shared clusters, where we've actually been able to squeeze the cluster, therefore taking resources off the table and forcing the scheduler to co-locate more aggressively. And we've seen that we've actually raised almost 2x the utilization across the board, which is a huge win for us. Uh, and it's something that we know we can do better, but it's one that's actually uh, very good, especially given the fact we had a PhD intern and uh, one of the professors at Stanford who'd done different internships and uh, uh, sabbaticals at uh, Google, and Microsoft, and some of these others. And it was very clear that some of the data they were collecting, they had not seen the utilization that high at some of these companies. I think Google's doing really well, but I think some of the other ones are not, are not using their clusters nearly as well. Um, obviously, the single deployment strategy is a big win for us now that we have th hundreds, if not thousands, of services. And the fact that they can restart at the, on a dime means that it's really nice uh, from an operational perspective. And the service recovery is automatic. Um, so now when racks go out or hardware fails or even the process fails, it's not something that we have to get up in the night. So before, Twitter's a very classic internet company where you're on call if you're a developer. Um, Early days, that was a very harsh experience. Now it's not. This is one of the reasons that it's not. Um, you don't actually get woken up when hardware fails or things just by restarting get better. It's usually load related or a deployment that causes those issues now. I also wanted to call out some of the trade-offs when it comes to the, the, the cloud strategy that we've gone after. One is the performance isolation. Performance isolation is really hard. It doesn't matter if you use uh, virtualization or not. Actually, I'd argue in the virtualization case, it's actually harder to do the debugging because you have more stack to figure out. But in any case, trying to isolate one from the other is actually relatively difficult. There's known technologies. We use Linux, uh, C groups, and namespaces. 
but it's one where you, especially with a web service where you have very different load from minute to minute, there's usually a, a rough uh, characteristic to it, but you can imagine in the case of a tsunami or a riot or a star going crazy and talking about all sorts of nonsense, um, you get to a place where you have uh, constraints on those processes and you have to make sure that whatever those processes do, whatever they're doing computationally, in memory, whatever, they don't actually stomp on the person next to them. So your trade-off in these worlds is latency, right? The, more, the higher you dri drive your utilization, the more your latency could be affected. And for us, it's super critical that latency is really low. So that's hard. Service discovery and routing are far more complex than they were in a static world. Um, and in the SOA, it gets even worse. So it's one where we have to invest a lot more effort into actually building that technology and thinking about it in a more critical way. And then the observability problem comes back. Um, now that things move around, you have no idea where they are from second to second. It gets incredibly hard to figure out how to debug a problem within the service tiers. So you have to build the observability stack. Luckily, most of these things we figured out. I think the only one that we're actually doing the phase two on is routing. So in the end, it's been a huge win for us. Uh, breaking up our monolith into multiple different pieces and then putting them on the cloud is a really nice way of building a global scale internet company. So kind of what are we doing next? So the things that we're thinking about next is more sophistic sophisticated scheduling when it comes to the, the cloud infrastructure. So as long as you have priorities when it comes to the jobs that you're running, you can imagine you can go in two different directions. One is preemption uh, and the other one is oversubscription. So you can imagine that if you have a, a tier zero job or a high priority job that wants to take over more resources, you can actually kill or preempt lower, lower priority tasks. The other thing too is that uh, there was this great conversation I had with a, a professor uh, who, had who had designed hardware caches for something like 20 years. And he made a really interesting and cool comment. He was like, I've, des I've designed hardware caches for about 20 years, but if you sit me down at a computer and I developed a piece of software, I cannot answer how that piece of software is gonna use the hardware cache that I designed. So it's interesting extrapolating that out to ask service owners to answer the question of how much memory and how much CPU are you gonna use? You can empirically get that, but it's not one that they're gonna very easily be able to answer. And as time changes and as the traffic changes, it gets even harder. So it's one of those things where you really need to figure out maybe that's not the best way of doing it. Maybe it's a good approximation, but it's not one where you want to necessarily bet the farm on. So what you usually do is you over-exaggerate the resources you need, which again leaves things on the data center floor. You're wasting money. So the way you can deal with this is you can take lower priority jobs and actually uh, schedule them into the, 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 re the reservations of the higher priority jobs with a guarantee that if the higher priority job ever needed it, that guy gets kicked off within hundreds of milliseconds and you won't actually see a latency blip. So we're thinking about and trying to figure that out. The other thing too is that as you start to think of the cloud, the nirvana is always that the scheduler has more and more signal coming into it and that you can start to make scheduling decisions based upon a number of different things. One is you can imagine load. So for your tier zero stuff, you can imagine saying, okay, I'm gonna take signal for the spike and I'm actually gonna expand this tier and then when it goes away, I'm gonna shrink it and start using your cluster in a far more efficient way. That one's hard. It also in includes a lot of predictive stuff. We actually did, uh, the intern from Stanford last year did really good work and showed that we could actually, with our traffic, get some pretty good wins that way. But it's risky and I'd, uh, it's not ready for production for sure. The other one, which actually Jeff is working on uh, with folks here, um, is trying to think about now that we've kind of abstracted the developer away from the hardware, how could we be smarter about identifying hardware failure? So how could we identify hardware failure, drain those nodes and put them through the process to get them fixed and out of the cluster as quickly as possible? Um, the other thing too is you can imagine that there's, as long as we ha start to get these hardware failure signals, well maybe a piece of hardware hasn't failed completely but a little bit, um, MCEs come to mind where you can deprovision a bank or whatever. Um, you can start to use that also in your scheduling. So you can start to think about this. So these are the kinds of things that we'd like to be thinking about not only from the software side but also from the hardware side. Especially as we start to see hundreds of thousands of boxes going to the data center. And especially as what I'd love to see, and I've told the hardware guys this, I'd love at some point for them to come ask me, hey, could we cut the hardware costs in half but could we double the hardware failures? That'd be great. It'd be fantastic, because then I can actually say, okay, the cloud can deal with that. We basically build a, a, a hardware cache that can deal with that failure rate. We can pull them in very easily. 
And then we actually drop the capex or the cost of the way we do business. So it's a really flexible and a really nice way. It also gives us a lot of ways of designing hardware in different ways that may be more prone to failure or maybe going our own way. I don't know. But it's something. Do you think we have enough dollars? We do. We do. <laughs> we really do. Um, it's not something right now we actually pull into any of our scheduling, but it is something that we're becoming much more aware of. Um, and it's. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, right now we're not actually doing anything, like I said, with power. But I wouldn't be surprised if in the next year or two that becomes one of the dominant costs. And we have to figure out how to deal with it in a better way. But the nice part is because we've abstracted a lot of the people away from the specifics of the hardware, we can actually start to do things where we could co-locate things on the same box, we could maybe if we, especially in the multi data center world, schedule things to different data centers where we have different costs for power. There's a lot of options that we have given the substrate that we've built, but it's definitely one, especially when you start to have so many systems that you have to care about. Uh, uh, running multiple frameworks in parallel. Um, this is basically where we're thinking about running um, multiple schedulers within our cluster. And you can imagine in this case where we're thinking about having the scheduler of Aurora, which is our long running jobs, our long services, co standing side to side and running on the slave, or running jobs on the same slaves, obviously not overlapping, with things like Storm, which is one of our stream compute. Uh, I use the Jenkins icon here, not necessarily because we're only gonna use Jenkins, but for our build and test, that's something else I'm um, becoming more responsible for now, where I'd like to use thousands of nodes to do uh, distributed test and distributed build in seconds as opposed to hours. So there's plenty of cracks. We obviously have cracks in our data center utilization because of DR compliance. These are the perfect things to put in there. And it means we don't have to dedicate hardware to them. And then Spark, which is a new framework that's coming up, which is streaming analytics. Here is basically what I'm showing is that if you run multiple of these frameworks on the same cluster that has high utilization, you actually could mash them together and you can get close to 100% utilization of the cluster itself. Obviously, this is all mock data. But there's two interesting things. One is that if you have access to more resources at the time that, uh, let's say, a storm job or a, a build needs, it actually can expand out to take those resources to get the job done faster and then come back. Obviously, this doesn't work as easily with long-running jobs, but it's one where we can start to think about how we would structure these frameworks so we can drive the utilization up, which is the last part of that slide. So I haven't talked a huge amount about data. I want to kind of focus on the SOA stuff because it was uh, the majority of my life for the last couple of years. But the interesting part is I've gotten more in, in, into the data. Twitter actually is a super lucky company in that we have lots of data. Our users give us lots of public data, which is awesome that it's public. Um, and in the case here, I kind of wanted to throw out some stats. Our, our Hadoop clusters have thousands of nodes. We ingest a few terabytes per hour of data and logs and other things. And we have tens of thousands of MapReduce jobs running daily. So it's super interesting for us to try and figure out how we could run these things faster. So if you had spare capacity running, lying around in the data center that you could actually devote to that job, that would be fantastic. So that's kind of the idea of Spark. Spark was actually built by people, uh, Ben Hinman, who I mentioned was the co-creator of Mesos. Actually, some of his co-creators actually went off and created Spark. Um, uh, actually, they just spun up a company off this technology. Um, but it's very interesting because they claim that it's going to give a 100x boost to a lot of the MapReduce jobs. We actually have just started playing with it, so I can't tell you that works or if it doesn't. But it's definitely something that we're interested in because it's a, a huge part of uh, what we want to kind of go where, where we want to go next on the infrastructure side. You can imagine reliability is a huge focus. Being able to build a huge amount of this distributed system in a meaningful way that obviously is efficient and yet reliable. And the next thing is, is our, you can think of the IP of Twitter really being in the data that we have and the connections that the people, the users have. And so now it becomes a question of how can we get to the real meat of the problem, which is trying to serve the data that's meaning to, meaningful to you where you are right now, right now. So you basically don't have to ask Twitter any questions. It actually just says, hey, you're at UW. From the stuff that you've done in the past and the people you follow, it's, it's clear that you're super interested in large internet company infrastructure projects. 
you should go to this room, it'd be really cool. Here's actually some pictures and maybe even here are the slides. So it's like one of those things where Twitter's goal in life is actually to be able to publish this data, the meaningful stuff to you right where you are. And so doing that analytics and thinking about that data in a much more fundamental way, uh, and obviously thinking about that very fast response time is something that we're really gonna try and invest in going forward. So kind of where does that leave us wrapping up? Kind of upon reflection, and, and this is the part where I'm, I think, talking to more academics than I am to industry people, is we all know writing large distributed systems is super hard. Getting it right, making sure that it's up 99.99% of the time, it's a real pain in the ass. But it's once you do it, it's a filling, but it doesn't seem like it has to be that hard. The other thing too is the spectrum, the, the spectrum that I mentioned before, you're kind of, how SOA do I go is a constant evolution and it's one where n there is no real answer to that question, but there's also not a whole lot of research or ideas when it comes to like, okay, here's the problem. And the reason I bring this up is mainly because I, I keep meeting, I'm obviously uh, living in San Francisco, and I keep meeting people who are building startups. And their first thing that they always do is they go to Rails or one of these service, uh, these development environments and basically build these services that will not test to t uh, stand up to the test of time. But they do that because it's easy. But there's gotta be a better way for us to build distributed systems. There's gotta be a better way for us to build programming languages uh, or think about the programming problem in a fundamentally different way so that when you approach the problem, you're abstracted away from those details. And the, the reason why I think this is actually super tractable and something that's at our fingertips is if you go to any of the VC pitches or anything that's going on within Silicon Valley right now, there is almost 100% guarantee that those services are running in Amazon. They don't care about computers anymore. They pay pennies for them, right? But the problem is, is that when they build the systems, they build the software that goes in those containers, it's just the same as it's always been. There's never a single way, there isn't a common way of building those systems. And that's a programming language problem and it's super interesting. And the last one kind of gets to the, the operations and the cloud stuff, which is we basically uh, went the same direction that Google did when they published about Borg and some of the other systems. But before we got there, it wasn't something that anybody else had really done. Now there's a proliferation of uh, options when it comes to this. A lot of them still are doing it uh, with virtualization, but that's not a bad option. But it's one where there is no common way. So it seems like as developers, the last thing that we want to be thinking about when we're actually developing these systems is which computer are they running on? How is traffic going to be routed to them? If my piece of hardware or the process goes down, which happens a lot, uh, coming from kind of the embedded world of virtual machine monitor, you have this idea that software doesn't fail. It turns out it fails all the time and it's fine, it doesn't matter. But how can we build these distributed systems that can deal with that, that transient failure or permanent failure in, in easy ways? So I think we need to make this easier. We need to figure out from the industry and also from the academic side how we can teach the people who are going through school how to build some of these systems or even invest in the programming language primitives or in the infrastructure projects and put them in the open so that other people can start to not care as much about these problems. That is all from me. I want to thank you for coming.